You're asking yourself two burning questions right now. The first, unfortunately, I can't help you with. And if we could be honest for a minute, only you really know the answer to. Pause the video if you have to and take a long, deep look inside. But the second, I can answer. My lathe is set up with a collet chuck because the parts I'd like to make require quite the concentricity. Well, it's not exactly concentric. No, no. It is. This bar stock is really, really close to the final size of my parts. I can't really afford to have it five thou off or the outside diameter might not clean up all the way around. If this stock is off axis in the lathe, even a little, I won't be able to turn a clean OD of the correct size. If you've got some sweat on your brow because you don't own a collet chuck, no problem. A four jaw chuck, Wait a minute, I did it again, didn't I? This is the middle of the video, isn't it? I'm so embarrassed. Let's jump back in time and start again. Dracaris. Well, that's never happened before. This is aluminum black, which I would have bet the farm was called Aluma Black. But lucky for me, I don't own a farm. But talk about the Mandela effect, huh? I'm pretty sure we all know what this is. I've always seen it around anyway. Never tried it, never quite trusted it. In theory, I think this is basically cold blue, only for aluminum. I'm sure chemically it works different, but I think anyway, you dip aluminum parts in this stuff and they turn black. I mean, it says it right on the label. Aluminum black metal finish. Touch up scratched or married areas quickly. Quick refresher if this is coming out of the blue. Here is a metal part with no finish. This is as machined. Here is the same part or similar part that's been cold blued. Cold blue is an easy peasy room temperature process that, despite its name, turns metal parts black. Why would one want to turn their parts black, I hear you asking. Well, they look better. Tell me that doesn't look better. Dare I say, more professional. That, and I think the cold blue finish helps keep the parts from rusting, or slows the rusting down anyway. Though, these parts are about the same age, probably exactly the same age, and the naked one hasn't rusted yet. Shows almost no signs of rusting. Heck, now that I think about it, I have blued parts that have rusted. So, what do I know? Nonetheless, in my opinion, this looks better. If I may speak chemically for a moment, the cold blue stuff is selenium dioxide. I think we've mentioned that before in this channel, but most well-adjusted people call it cold blue. And it only works with steel. Anyway, aluminum black. Despite the fact that I'm holding it in my hand right now, this is advertised as non-dimensional. That means it's not paint. It won't add size to your part. I don't know if it oxidizes the aluminum, maybe pits it, nooks and crannies and all that, and dyes it black below the surface or what it does, but we'll see how it goes. So why have I been hesitant to try this stuff? I don't know. I've always known aluminum to require anodizing to turn it black, or a color, I guess. I don't understand how a room temperature process like this could do it and not just wipe clean off. Second, I've only really seen it used and advertised for small touch-ups scratches, things like that. I've never seen it used to black an entire part. So there must be a catch, right? Yeah, sure, I probably could have checked online before spending my money. See the sorts of results others have gotten, but I'm stubborn. Your first instinct might be to grab some aluminum out of your scrap pile, clean it up a bit, and try a little sample part of scrap, right? Easy, but let me stop you right there. I happen to have a master's degree in Murphy's Law. If we tried this on a part that meant absolutely nothing to us, it would work perfect. It'd be black as night and bulletproof. Most beautiful thing you've ever laid your eyes on. With that confidence, well, you might go on to make promises you probably won't be able to keep and end up with egg on your face and parts that look like poop. And not that cool looking black poop you get sometimes. So in order to really test this, we need to make something that means something to us. We need a dog in this fight, a horse in this race, a fox in this hen house, a subplot 
for this video. Let's make a couple of these. This is a magazine, like one you might find in a newsstand, but different. First, this is made of metal, specifically aluminum. How serendipitous. Second, instead of articles and photos of unattainable beauty standards, it holds pellets, which is convenient because until now, I've had to hold them in my nose. If you're wondering, these are 177 pellets, or 4.5 millimeters if you're feeling international. You just push them in, this one holds 14 pellets. They're cleverly, or not so cleverly, held in with two little O-rings. I can get these out without breaking them. Just a little friction fit without the O-ring. They don't really stay in there. I have two of these, and I'd like to make two more. If we look at some of the details, there's the center hole that it pivots around, 14 holes around the edge. There's a groove for those O-rings, and there's this gear-like feature that is used for indexing. A little pin or lever comes in and just pushes it to the next hole. There are some little grooves around the edges. A detent pin goes in here, and that's really it. If you're wondering if I couldn't just buy more of these, first, you're in the wrong place. And second, no, I can't. They're nowhere to be found. No stock left in the size that I need. And I can't really wait either. If I don't act fast, how will me and my children hold back the beer and pop can invasion? They're almost an inch and a half in diameter and pretty darn close to half inch thick. Again, 14 holes, the gear feature, some divots around the perimeter, and the groove for the O-rings. Nothing I don't think we can't do. In fact, if I were making just one, this wouldn't be too much of a challenge for a manual mill and a rotary table. Okay, maybe a little bit of a challenge. And you might need a dividing head instead of a rotary table to get 14 accurate divisions. But since I want to make two, and I'd like to hold on to my will to live, we'll do it on the CNC. I already have bar stock that's pretty darn close to this size. I think we can rough out these diameters, turn this groove, and then just use the CNC to put in the holes, this little gear feature, and the detents. That bar stock is already in the lathe, so let's head over. Uh, it's not here. Or more accurately, it's not here yet. It should probably appear any minute now. Did I go too far? Is this even the right day? Hold on, I'm gonna go check my phone. Yeah, 2022, that's right, I think. You know what, it's probably just still back in the rack. I can just wait, wait one minute. Am I about to trap myself for an eternity in one of those paradoxes my great-great-grandchildren keep warning me about? As much as I'd like to tempt fate, I am a married man. I have this aluminum cutoff, so let's just see and see the whole thing. No lathe. Not for now, anyway. Lathe still might be the fastest way to clean up the back face, but we'll see. But first things first, usually, let's get all of these dimensions and move the part into CAD. This O-ring groove is the reason I wanted to start on the lathe. In 3-axis CNC, this groove is an undercut. There's no way for a tool that comes from the top to get under there. And that presents a challenge. I am not much for challenges. But, as things go, I'm gonna have to make one. You could, in theory, CNC most of these features, the ones you can get at from the top, and then at the end put the part in the lathe and cut the groove. But we'd have to hold on to it this way, on that small detent side, if we want to cut a groove and clean up the back in one operation. But that wouldn't be a lot to hold on to, or register with. And the less we flip this part around and move it between machines, the better. So to do this on the mill, we'll have to cut the o-ring groove from the top, and we essentially need to make or buy, I guess, a T-slot style cutter. Let's...
And that, my friends, is how you make a five flute cutter with a six sided block. I'm gonna have to watch that video again. Did I grab onto the flange maybe? I don't know what I did, but I can tell you what I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna make another one of these. This is hardened, tempered, and sharpened on the grinder. With this tool, we should now be able to come in from the top and get underneath to mill that O-ring groove. Hate to toot my own horn, but these turned out pretty nice. Except I might have done something wrong in the CAD. Just pulling your leg, parts of the right size. Well, close anyway. I mic'd them and was three thou off on the thickness. Most likely, I think, an error picking up the zero after a tool change. Or maybe I forgot to add a finish pass, but here they are. I cleaned up that thickness on the lathe. Not as hard to hold after all, at least just for facing, not for cutting that groove, but I had to be careful and indicate them in. Again, there's not a lot to grab onto. I realize I haven't shown you every step of making these, but this is a machining channel, and I want to keep the videos manageable, so only makes sense to cut out the machining. Wasn't anything too exciting anyway. Some might say, run of the mill. <clears throat> Though I probably owe it to you to at least show the slot cutter in action. It did pretty good for a five and a half tooth cutter. It's probably hard to see here, but it's making nice clean baby chips. I did, however, have to hog out a fair bit of material around the parts to make clearance for the size of the slot cutter so it could drop in, get in there, and get back out without fouling the other parts or the vise for that matter. Before that, it was just a bunch of spot facing, then drilling, and some reaming. You really didn't miss much. But if you're interested, check out any other one of my videos that include a hole. But all of that has conspired to bring us here, my friends, to the present. I've run into a bit of a pickle I hadn't given much or any consideration to whatsoever. These parts are really hard to deburr, specifically where the o ring groove cuts into the holes. See that little square window of sorts? That's the opening that lets the O-ring actually do its thing. But those edges are really sharp, and there are a lot of burrs in there I'd like to clean out. Deburring these parts by hand is nigh impossible. What these need is a vibratory tumbler. If you don't know what that is, imagine a washing machine, basically, but chock full of rocks. The parts jiggle around in there, bumping into abrasive media. Rocks, pellets, walnut shells, and viola, they're deburred. Now, I don't have a box of rocks, nor do I have a washing machine I could fill full of rocks without getting in trouble. But what I do have is a can half full of blasting media, or half empty, I suppose, depending just how sunny your disposition might be. Now, this isn't the right stuff to use. This is very sharp silica sand, I think. But that's all I've got, and I'm gonna see if it'll deburr my parts. I don't expect it to work. In fact, I highly doubt it. But like I told my wife on our first date, let's just give it a try. See what happens. Besides not having a box of rocks or a washing machine I can't put them into, I also don't have a lid for this can. This is so not going to end well. What we're looking for is relative motion between the parts and the abrasive. Normally, I think you'd deburr for four, five, six, 24 hours. But given how aggressive this stuff is, I'm going to check it, I don't know, 10 minute intervals. The filing machine did nothing good. I did speed it up compared to what you saw. In that clip, it Really wasn't doing anything at all, parts just sitting on top. But then I got it moving fast enough to hear things banging around. Nonetheless, after, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, I was really only getting surface pitting and no real deburring. I think I was running into like a Brazil nut effect or a reverse Brazil nut effect. I have no idea. I'm not even sure I know what a Brazil nut is. So I started trying out some of the other machine tools. Completely inexplicably, the bandsaw did even less than the die filer. 
But then I tried the lathe. I didn't start with the lathe because I figured at the can diameter that I'm using, it wouldn't run slow enough to get the parts and sand in there rolling around on each other. I figured the parts would stick to the walls like one of those cyclone rides and potentially lose their pants. So I've had a look at these under high magnification and it's debatable if that lathe actually did anything at all. I mean, maybe. This ran for an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes before I got sick and tired of hearing that lathe spin. It did knock some of the sharp edges off those windows, at least maybe the little chips that were just barely hanging on, but there's still sharpish edges. I'm gonna give this a once over with a small stone, just to play it safe. And I realized I didn't actually show you how these things work. So let me do Maybe you'd like to see that with the cover off. I suppose this is the moment we've all been waiting for. I'm happy with the parts, they're cleaned. I didn't have any 450% isopropyl alcohol, so I washed them all five times in some 90%. It looks like cold blue. You guys as nervous as I am? Fizzing, I wasn't expecting that. I probably shouldn't be breathing this stuff. I mean, that looks gross, but rather promising. I'm gonna drop another one in and go wash this off immediately. Well, it's kind of just washing right off, literally. Maybe I need to leave this in there longer. It looks like it's dissolving my part. Oh, it's hot. It's really quite hot. I don't know if I'm in focus, but it's flaking off. It's stuck on the back pretty good. I can't even tell you what that smells like. I'm gonna go wash these a bit and just keep running them through the wringer here. So after a few washes and a few dunks, maybe not bad. All in all, it was a little more violent than I expected, but then I realized I didn't really follow the instructions. I should have left one behind and just kind of brushed this stuff on. But here's what it looks like when it's sort of dry. Wash this in water, blew it down with the air gun. This is still a little humid. If I leave this to dry, it's gonna look like this. And this one is this with oil on it. So the surface does become very porous. The parts are almost fuzzy. You see that texture on the back? I'm not sure if it's the stuff or if it pitted the part. Hopefully you can see this, or the surface finish rather. This is the original factory part, anodized I assume. Here's the one I did the longest ago. It's oiled. That's the one we just oiled together. And that is out of the solution, washed and dried. I'm not sure what that orangey stuff is on there. Maybe there's some chemist out there that can tell us what's going on. But can you see that? It's sort of got a texture to it, almost like the aluminum's been pitted. It didn't attack that smooth side as aggressively. This was the lathe turned finished side. Yeah, it looks like a really light blast, a very fine orange peel. I'm gonna finish these other ones before it's too late. Before we get into any lessons learned here, I just wanna say in editing the footage you've seen so far, I'll be honest, these parts look like trash zoomed in. Sure, in real life, they're not winning any beauty contests, but no one can see these as well as you've been looking at them under high magnification. For reference, these are about the size of an Oreo cookie, maybe a little smaller. That said, let's cover some of the key takeaways. First, I don't recommend whole hog dunking your parts in this stuff. Perhaps just brush it on like the instructions say. Or if you do dunk, maybe don't let them cook for so long. Perhaps just in and out. I'm getting the impression it's better to just build this finish up slowly. Second, if you're gonna try this on a lot of aluminum, crack a window or something. The cyanide gas or whatever it gives off is brutal. Probably not a big deal if you're just doing little scratches and scuff marks. Third, if you don't follow the instructions on the bottle, this stuff is not non-dimensional. I'd go so far as to call it dimensional. My parts have grown about one to one and a half thou all over. 
though I suppose that might be non-dimensional to some. I'm not judging. Fourth, I think we're up to four, don't be a hero. Would it have killed you to try this on some scrap first? Lastly, perhaps most important, thanks for watching. I stripped all that black off, wire brush and scotch bright. The holes, which are the most important part of these things, closed up more than a few thou, so I reamed them out. And although that finish seemed very durable, at least to the parts it actually stuck to, while reaming, it sort of broke out in flakes, which freaked me out. What if little bits of this come loose later and foul up the works? That'd be no good. So in conclusion, just like I said at the beginning, try some aluminum black inappropriately to get that aged, weathered look on your aluminum parts. You sit there and tell me these don't look like 25 cent parts from a yard sale.